get a few more people in. Uh, the numbers are rising steadily. Oh. Pardon me, I have a lot of clocks in my house and they all go off at the same time. Okay, I think we're just about ready to go. Thank you very much for uh, participating or viewing this webinar. My name is Michael Swain. I'm the director of the East Asia program at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft and the moderator of this evening's webinar, evening for us at least on the East Coast entitled Envisioning a U.S. Strategy of Restraint in the South China Sea and Beyond, uh, uh, an event which is centered on a recently published uh, paper, a report uh, by QI written by Rachel O'Dell, uh, who since her, her writing of this in July has moved on and is taking a position in the State Department. Um, her uh, report was entitled Promoting Peace and Stability in the Maritime Order Amid China's Rise, uh, a paper which was in turn based on her dissertation at MIT, which looked in some detail at uh, maritime issues around the world and maritime law and how countries handle different aspects of maritime law. But of course, the views expressed in her paper and the views expressed in this um, event this evening don't in any way reflect the views of the US government. As you probably know, the Biden administration repeats uh, somewhat endlessly the need to uphold the quote unquote rules based order, implying that it is being violated in a major way. And of course, one of the supposed primary violators is China. And supposedly, most notably, in the politics that China has in the South and the East China Seas. But what exactly is that rules based maritime order? How clearly is it defined and agreed upon? And how best could and should the US work to strengthen it and in the process reduce the chances of conflict uh, in this area, especially with regard to interactions with China? Um, Rachel's report offers both an assessment of the nature of this problem and recommendations on how best to stabilize it through military restraint through more effective diplomatic engagement and through expanded levels of crisis management so as to build a more cooperative and inclusive maritime order, not a polarized zero sum and uh, confrontational if not conflictual order. So to discuss these issues uh, raised in Rachel's report and others relating to the report, we have an excellent group of experts tonight uh, with somewhat different views on these different issues. I'll introduce them all uh, initially, and then we'll turn to each presentation. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Luo Xuxian, who is a postdoctoral research fellow at Brookings, recently at QI. She received her PhD at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies on Chinese crisis decision-making over maritime issues. And I was privileged to be on her dissertation committee. It was an excellent dissertation. Xu Shen will be standing in for Rachel, summarizing the main points of Rachel's report and at various points offering her own views um, in the conversation. Now, our three discussants and commentators are Mike Mochizuki, Beck Stratting, and Greg Poli. My good friend, Mike Mochizuki, is one of the leading US experts of Japanese foreign and security policy. He holds the Japan-US relations chair at George Washington University and is finishing a major book on Sino-Japanese relations. Beck Stratting is the executive director of La Trobe Asia and a senior lecturer in politics and international relations at La Trobe University in Australia, and is a leading expert on maritime disputes in Asia and Australian foreign and defense policy. We're very pleased to have Beck with us uh, this evening. And then Greg Poling is a senior fellow for Southeast Asia and director of the Asia Maritime Transparency Initiative at the Center for Strategic and International Studies here in DC. He's also a leading expert on maritime security issues, especially in Southeast Asia. We're very pleased to have Greg with us as well. So we'll start with Xu Shen, 
who will present Rachel's report in about 12 minutes, followed then by observations and comments by Mike, Beck, and by Greg. Now, not all of their comments will necessarily be directly in response to Rachel's uh, paper or Xu Shen's comments, but will be related in some way or another. So without any further delay, Xu Shen, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Dr. Swain, uh, and good evening to those of you who are in the United States, and good morning to those of you who are on the other side of, of the Pacific. It's my great honor to be on a panel with such a group of distinguished scholars uh, whose work have constantly inspired uh, junior scholars like Rachel and me. Uh, let me get to uh, Rachel's report uh, by sharing my screen. Um, Now, can everyone see the screen? Great. Uh, so Rachel basically uh, write this report based on her dissertation, Promoting Peace and Stability in the Maritime Order Amidst China's Rise. And uh, she basically knows that China, as China's econ economy take off and uh, China also rises, at the same time, China also rises the maritime power and, uh, and that drives up China's uh, growing demand for marine resources and also China's rapidly uh, growing economy finance the rapid, uh, the rapid modernization of China's merit, uh, military and maritime law enforcement capabilities and expansion of China's maritime presence in its vicinity areas and distant waters. While traditionally China has strongly objected to the U.S. bond ops and to U.S. military surveillance and reconnaissance operations in Chinese EEZ, um, more recently China's more recently China's uh, interpretation of freedom of navigation has increasingly moved toward that of the United States, as China has expanded its maritime operations in other countries' jurisdictional waters. And China's objections are also now uh, now also increasingly focused on spawn ops and closing operations. Well. Um, it objects uh, less free, well, Beijing objects less frequently to other U.S. military activities in South China Sea beyond the 12 nautical miles uh, territorial sea limit. Um, China's emergence as a maritime power has collided with America's long-standing dominance at sea and that given rise to uh, a mismatch U.S.-China perception. Because in the Chinese perception, uh, its increased naval and coast guard operations in South and East China seas are normal and to be expected from a country as large as China. But from the US perspective, uh, America's naval power and the norms that sustain such power um, are key to US interests and pose little threat to China. So China's denunciation of US military operations are seen as a signal that uh, in, in, indicative of China's desire to um, expel the United States from the region. And this mismatch in perception is further exacerbated um, as the disputes between China, as the sovereignty and jurisdiction disputes between China and its neighbors um, assume the context of great power competition. Because Beijing thinks that the United States is exploiting such uh, these disputes to weaken China, while Washington fears that um, its credibility and influence are depending on its capability of countering China's excessive claims and deterring aggressive actions taken by Beijing. In other countries, reactions to China's maritime rise have been mixed. On the one hand, China's maritime rise has heightened mar maritime tensions um, as China's expensive claims in South China Sea is growing presence on or, or near the disputed islands and its growing maritime law enforcement operations and militia presence in disputed waters have damaged its rela China's relations with neighbors. In addition to that, China's naval, civilian government research and fishing activities beyond disputed waters uh, have also caused anxiety in, in other countries as far as uh, those countries in Latin America. Um, on the other hand, despite all these tensions, most countries uh, have seen a overarching interest in preserving their economic ties and maintaining the peace with China. Moreover, um, China has, in recent, in recent years, China has, uh, has shown a degree of restraint. It has sometimes adjusted a course in response to criticism, especially in waters where it does not claim sovereignty right, sovereign rights or jurisdiction. And even in the South China Sea, China has since 2016 refrained from occupying new islands or reefs in Spratlys or conducting large scale land reclamation at, at the Scarborough Show. Considering all these uh, broad trends, uh, Rachel identified three core US interests in the Western Pacific going forward. First, uh, the prevention of armed conflict over territory, resources, and jurisdiction, especially conflict that could drag the United States into a direct war with China. Second, to ensure the free flow of commercial shipping through sea lanes and straits in the region. Uh, last but not least, 
sufficient to ensure uh, sufficient U.S. military access to enable monitoring and, if necessary, countering Chinese military activities that could be directed against the United States and or its allies. And based on in view, uh, based on to to safe, to protect uh, these three uh, broad set of U.S. core interests in the Western Pacific, Rachel recommends three uh, re made recommendation for the United States fall, uh, falling under three broad uh, issue areas. First, in the in South China Sea and East China Sea disputes, um, the United States should exercise due deterrence in contentious disputes between China and the U.S. allies and reduce the militarization of these disputes. Second, uh, the United States should support ongoing negotiation between ASEAN and China uh, for a code of conduct, um, and a along with a declaration of no first use force to settle, set to settle the disputes in South China Sea. Third, uh, the United States should encourage pragmatic solutions for joint uh, ju jurisdiction in the South China Sea. And uh, the United States should also avoid the temptation to act as a unilateral enforcer of the 2016 arbitration. And last but not least, uh, the United States should not encourage Vietnam or other claimants to initiate arbitration against China without China's agreement to uh, participate. The second set of um, the second group of recommendations for the United States fall under the issue area of freedom of navigation and maritime order. So the United States, to begin with, the United States should significantly reduce FONOPS and stress the diplomatic element of freedom of navigation program instead. And the United States should reach agreement with China where Beijing affirms freedom of navigation for military vessels in South China Sea and US uh, and the United States should agree to, should agree to uh, reduce FONOPS. And the United, United States should also uh, support negotiation for a new regional agreement on foreign military activities within countries EEZ and territorial seas in a venue, uh, in a neutral venue like uh, the ASEAN Regional Forum. And of course, on this part, uh, it should uh, ratify UNCLOS and um, conclude a future international agreement on biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. And uh, the United States, along with other countries in the region, uh, should support a collaborative collaborative ma uh, maritime security to confront shared, uh, cha uh, shared challenges in the maritime domain, such as piracy, uh, smuggling, weapons, proliferation, human trafficking, and uh, illegal, under, uh, illegal, unregulated, unreported fishing activities. The last set of uh, recommendation for the United States fall under uh, the area of maritime crisis prevention and management. Um, first, uh, the United States should the United States should fully implement uh, its, agreement, its two agreements with China, which were reached between 2014 and to 2015, on um, the notification of major mil military activities and encounters between air forces and naval vessels at sea. And second, um, the two countries should revitalize their longstanding annual talks under the Military Maritime Consultative Agreement, which was co uh, concluded back in 1998. Um, Third, uh, the United States should pursue an agreement with China on how to manage encounters involving uh, Coast Guard vessels, which was, which was uh, according to a, a pledge made, by, uh, made back in 2015. Um, fourth, um, the two countries should improve their crisis communications uh, channels between uh, military and civilian entities. Last, um, but probably most significant, both, both countries uh, should acknowledge mutual vulnerability in the nuclear realm. So here I conclude uh, my presentation on Rachel's behalf. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Xu Shen. That's you've covered a, a lot of ground in a in a short amount of time, and you are very much within time. So very commendable. Uh, there are a lot of things you put on the table here, including um, aspects about what exactly the base is of the or basic nature is of the issue here. Uh, in the maritime disputes, as well as uh, what some recommendations should be for handling these problems, some of which are to really try to breathe new life into existing agreements, which have been allowed to atrophy over the years for one reason or another. And another is to really try to demilitarize the overall situation in the South China Sea as, as much as possible. And I'm sure that um, Rachel would uh, recommend that this also occur in the disputes that exist in the East China Sea as well, uh, primarily between Japan and China. And speaking of Japan, um, I will now uh, turn the floor over to Mike Mochizuki for his comments. Mike. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. And, and thank you for inviting me to participate in this webinar and congratulations uh, to Rachel for an excellent policy brief.
Uh, I can probably uh, contribute most to this uh, conversation uh, by bringing in the Japan factor. And in the limited time I have, let me just make uh, four points that I think essentially support Rachel's analysis and recommendations. Uh, my first point concerns the origins of the territorial disputes in the South China Sea. And this is, of course, a complicated historical process, uh, but Japan is indeed a major factor. Uh, after 1939, uh, the Spratleys and Paracels were administratively part of Taiwan under the Japanese Empire. And during World War II, Japan occupied some of the maritime features for military use. The Republic of China took control of the maritime features in 1946 after Japan's surrender, uh, but the ROC military withdrew from the Spratlys and Paracels after losing to the communists in the Chinese Civil War. But in, uh, in the 1951 San Francisco Peace Treaty, Japan renounced all claims to the Spratlys and Paracels, but the treaty did not specify to whom these features would go. But the 1952 Treaty of Taipei between the Republic of China and Japan explicitly mentioned Japan's renunciation of its claims to the Spratlys and Paracels. Accordingly, the Republic of China on Taiwan and the People's Republic of China both justify their claim to all of the Spratlys and Paracels under international law. Although the PRC now controls the Paracels, most of the features in the Spratlys are not controlled by either the PRC or the ROC. Therefore, from the perspective of both Beijing and Taipei, the current status quo is inconsistent with international law. And recognition of this is important in understanding China's policies and behavior. My second point relates to the discourse about defending and promoting a rules-based order. But I would like to raise the possibility that the so-called rules-based order could exacerbate international conflicts rather than mitigate them. And Japan is an example of this. As negotiations about a new convention of the law of the sea began in the early 1970s, Japan's original position was quite conservative. Japan initially did not favor expanding maritime demarcations beyond territorial waters of three nautical miles. But as many coastal states in the international community began pushing for exclusive economic zones, as well as an extension of territorial waters from three to 12 nautical miles, Japan acquiesced and embraced this trend. Now Japan is one of the countries that most vigorously maximizes its claims under UNCLOS. For example, Japan claims an EEZ around Okinotorishima. It is obvious that Okinotorishima does not meet the UNCLOS standard of an island that merits an EEZ. This example illustrates a shortcoming of the so-called rules-based maritime order. The UNCLOS order incentivizes states to maximize their claims and thereby exacerbate maritime disputes. One of the original motivations for UNCLOS was to promote the protection of the common heritage of mankind. Unfortunately, the cur current rules-based order does not do enough to mandate states to do more to protect this common heritage. Rather, the order is skewed to maximizing the rights of states rather than emphasizing the obligations or responsibilities of states. My third point relates to the regulation of military activities. As the leading naval power, the US position has been to minimize restrictions on naval ships under UNCLOS. This issue of regulating military activity in the seas was one of the most controversial issues in the international negotiations that yielded UNCLOS. And because a clear and concrete agreement could not be reached, UNCLOS contains ambiguous language regarding military activity in the maritime space. The United States, through its freedom of navigation operations, has assumed for itself the responsibility of making sure that restrictions on the movement and operations of naval ships in the oceans remain minimal. 
China has tended to favor a more restrictive interpretation of UNCLOS. But as Rachel Brief indicates, as China's naval capabilities and geographic reach have expanded, China's interpretation appears to be converging towards that of the United States. But this trend puts Japan in a dilemma because Japan depends on the United States for security, Japan needs to support the US position about limiting restrictions on naval vessels. Given Japan's proximity to China, however, the more that China's legal interpretation converges with that of the United States, Japan faces the prospect of ever increasing Chinese naval operations and movements in waters near Japan and through Japanese straits. As a result, Japan has an interest in confidence building measures that regulate naval activities. Rachel's recommendations are consistent with such Japanese thinking. Finally, I would like to comment on the Senkaku Daoyu Island issue. Although much of the focus about maritime order has been about the South China Sea, it is about the Senkakus, not the disputes in the South China Sea, that the United States has explicitly declared a treaty-based defense commitment. Today, the Japanese government insists that there is no territorial dispute with China and that there was no understanding to set aside this issue. Nevertheless, both Japan and China behaved on many occasions as if there was such a tacit understanding. For example, the Japanese government rebuffed proposals to construct a helipad on the Senkakus. Japanese advocates of this proposal argued that such a helipad would buttress Japan's administrative control over the Senkakus. But for the sake of good Japan-China relations, the Japanese government rejected this proposal. So for a couple of decades, mutual restraint kept the Senkaku Delu issue from escalating tensions between Japan and China. So what explains the escalation of tensions over the last three decades? I would argue that this escalation has resulted to a significant degree because of the provocative actions of nationalistic and activist groups, whether they are on the Japanese side or on the Chinese, Hong Kong, and Taiwanese side. Such provocative actions also lie behind the recent escalation of tensions between Japan and China. Given this situation, states like Japan and China need to explore arrangements that would prevent such provocations. A simplistic policy of military deterrence and a repetition of the mantra that the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty applies to the Senkakus are woefully inadequate to mitigate the danger of military conflict and to reduce tensions. Thank you very much. Great, thanks very much, Mike. Uh, that, was, that was really a great overview of the uh, situation, particularly involving Japan and the need to really try to look into the historical record with a little bit more care to understand exactly what was and was not done, either explicitly or indirectly by the different uh, claimants involved that often gets lost, particularly in the public accounting of these kinds of disputes where uh, each side postures for various reasons that often have to do more with domestic politics and nationalism than they do with the legal conditions and the actual strategic relationships between the two countries and what needs to be done. Um, so that was, that was really interesting. And I hope uh, we can get some uh, further questions in the question and answer on some of the things that uh, Mike has said. But next, I'd like to turn to Beck and get her views on all of this. Beck, the floor is yours. Or is Myra it? Myra of there she Rachel. Is. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, are you able to hear me? I've just got yeah, a you were frozen. You were just frozen there for a second, Beck, but you're okay now. 
Okay, I'm coming in from lockdown Melbourne. Maybe my internet is in lockdown too. So hopefully we won't freeze anymore. But uh, I was just saying that I'm a long time admirer of Re Rachel's research. Uh, and I think that the, the work in this report uh, and her research more generally provides really valuable insights into competing visions of maritime order and the rules that underpin it. And I think that there's a, a number of reasonable recommendations for the US in providing robust support for regional and global efforts to negotiate new norms to govern maritime order in this report. And I'd like to highlight three. Uh, the first is US ratifying UNCLOS and avoiding acting like a unilateral arbiter of maritime rules. As an outsider, this seems like a no-brainer to me, and I understand that uh, there may be political challenges in Washington, uh, but I think this is really crucial for avoiding uh, the US being accused of uh, charges of great power exceptionalism. Uh, the second is supporting a consistent and consensus driven approach to international law of the sea and working to negotiate rules where interpretations differ. As Mike talked about, the ambiguities of international law have allowed some of these interpretations or differing interpretations to emerge uh, or to negotiate new rules where gaps in international law exist. And the third recommendation that I really support is this idea of a more collaborative maritime uh, security efforts to confront shared maritime challenges, including in the areas of confidence building uh, measures. But I do want to raise two issues. First, I think that there are two competing perceptions of maritime China that affect whether an agreement might be negotiated on freedom of navigation. First, there's this perception of China as a maritime exception state that treats the near seas as differently from uh, the far seas. And then there's a second perception of China as a maritime revisionist state that's really seeking to revolutionise the maritime order. And I think these two perceptions are, are, are sort of exist within the discourses around China's maritime intentions and might make it difficult uh, in terms of domestic uh, politics uh, to, to support um, negotiating on some of these uh, norms. And I think Rachel's report is really useful here in understanding Beijing's differing maritime priorities. And while Beijing might be moving closer to a US conception of freedom of navigation, China's treatment of the South China Sea as a, a sort of sui generis zone, or increasingly as a jurisdictional sea to be treated more like land than sea, uh, may ultimately undermine the development of a maritime order that's inclusive and global. Uh, the second point that I really wanted to consider is the role of smaller and middle powers in shaping maritime order because uh, I guess an inclusive maritime order is one that involves not just the great powers uh, and whether these states want a restrained US. I mean I'm as I said I'm zooming in from Australia a country that's just signed an historic AUKUS security agreement with the US and the United Kingdom to acquire at least eight new nuclear powered submarines uh, and one of the touted benefits in the public discussions about these submarines is that it will enable the Royal Australian Navy to spend more time in the South China Sea. Uh, like the United States, Australia is a non-claimant state in the South and the East China Seas. Uh, and, you know, the, we, we, I don't think that we have a real discussion about what uh, Australia wants to do in these maritime areas with these nuclear-powered submarines. Uh, we also have our own issues with the rules-based order. Uh, Mike mentioned some... Uh, around Japan. Australia has a dubious maritime zone over an extensive exclusive economic zone and continental shelf claim off the Australian Antarctic Territory that the US does not recognise. Uh, Japan doesn't recognise it either, and nor does India. But my point here is that Australia, I don't think this is a country that wants a restrained US. Its leaders support a vision of maritime order predicated on military deterrence and US leadership. Australia has resisted the pressure to conduct US-style freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea and has argued instead that it has its own program of operational presence uh, that it views as less provocative. 
but successive Australian governments have sought to anchor US military presence in the region based on a calculation that the rules-based order is ultimately underpinned by power and that a US-led order is preferable to alternatives. And while the legitimacy of law of the sea matters for middle-sized states such as Australia, which has, you know, the world's third largest exclusive economic zone to try to protect despite being, uh, you know, only having a population of 25 million people. When it talks about the rules-based order, it's really talking about the US-led order. That is what Australia is seeking uh, to defend. And I'm not sure that Australia is the only one that tilts in this direction as East Asia's seas are becoming increasingly crowded with warships, not just from Australia and the United United States, but from Britain, from France, Korea and Japan, obviously, India uh, and New Zealand. So I think while regional states have sought to maintain economic relations uh, with Beijing and avoid unnecessary provocation, I think that there may be, uh, I think there's an extent to which uh, this has constrained their maritime activism is shifting, even maybe in maritime Southeast Asia. And on this point, I'd be interested to hear what Greg has to say about that. Uh, so the point I'd just like to, to finish on is that a maritime order that is inclusive can't just be based on what great powers want, but should account for the diverse interests and perceptions of smaller and middle powers. Thank you. Great, Beck. Thank you very much. That was a great uh, contribution. I, I should just say that um, speaking about the importance of middle powers, uh, that is something that we're particularly attentive to in the East Asia program uh, at Quincy. And we want to uh, start a, a, a webinar or a series of webinars that addresses specifically the role of middle powers in Asia and what their views are on uh, both you know, the future of the region, uh, the security environment here, uh, the U.S.-China relationship and uh, where they would like to see it go in the future, because I think there's a lot of sort of sloganeering that goes on about the position of a lot of Asian middle powers and what they want or what they don't want. And I think uh, it would be useful to try and shed some more light on these issues in the future. So I'm really glad to hear your comments and hope you can participate in that in the future as well. So thank you very much. Um, and now we'll turn to Greg, um, who, as we always say, certainly is Last but not least, Greg, you're on. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and, and thanks to, to Rachel uh, for really, I think, thoughtful and thought-provoking paper. We have discussed some of these recommendations in the past in other public and private fora. I agree with some of them. I think where I differ from Rachel mostly is on prioritization and focus. And I'm going to echo some of the things that, that Beck just said. So one of the things I'll give Rachel for uh, Rachel credit for right away is that I think she does a very good job of prioritizing accurately Chinese interests in the South China Sea by saying that not just for China, but for all the claimants, the South uh, China Sea and the East China Sea disputes are primarily about nationalist sentiment. It is, you know, competition for resources and uh, law of the sea second. And I think that because too often we read about these very um, technical, you know, technocratic fixes about joint development and fisheries as if that was what the disputes are about. And it's not, right? This is about the growth of Chinese power, the growth of Chinese power vis-a-vis -vis both the U.S. And, and its neighbors, as Rachel says, and nationalist sentiment, the fairy tales that claimants have told themselves that makes them willing to fight over things that are illegal or things that are strategically unimportant. She sees two options to, to addressing this um, very broadly. First is establishing a US-China detente. Second is what she calls building a, an inclusive maritime order. But Rachel's quite clear right up top that these are not both necessary. The first is necessary and the second would be really nice to have. But even if you can't have the inclusive maritime order, it's critical to get a US-China detente. And so when you, when you get to the recommendations, I, again, agree with a lot of what Rachel lays out for how to get to that U.S.-China detente. I agree with her that, for instance, there should be a negotiation uh, at some point down the line about the rules for uh, prior notification and instant passage. This was probably the majority opinion at UNCLOSE 1 and 2 in 1958-1960, and, uh, and it almost killed UNCLOSE 3 at the 11th hour. So the U.S. probably is still in the minority when it comes to this. I agree that even though UNCLOSE is quite clear about military activities within the EEZ, that doesn't mean we can't have side negotiations as we did with the Soviets to try to de-escalate, right? We won't do certain patrols within certain distances, et cetera. Um, no need to poke each other in the eye unnecessarily. 
Uh, I'm even open to the idea that we need to decrease the frequency of fawn off at some point down the line in order to reduce tensions. I also agree with all of the recommendations under the maritime crisis prevention section of Rachel's paper. Um, I would argue that in most cases, things like cues, for instance, and coal regs haven't been followed mostly by Beijing, but that doesn't mean we give up uh, and stop trying to, to manage crises. And the Biden administration, Secretary Austin included, have been quite clear that this is a top priority for them. Tensions aren't going away anytime soon. We certainly need crisis prevention mechanisms. The problem is that I think those two sections of the recommendations, where I largely agree, are presented as sufficient in and of themselves. And the third section, the ones actually presented first in the recommendations on the actual issues in the South and East China Sea disputes are kind of nice to have, and they are largely just calls for the status quo. So Rachel says that the, the US should, as she says, dual deter, what, what Xu Shen showed on her slides, dual deterrence, um, telling US allies, especially Philippines and, and Japan, that the US will defend them from attack, but remains neutral on territorial sovereignty questions, and will not defend them necessarily if they start the fight. Well, that's been explicit US policy since 1975, at least in the case of the Philippines. We've told the Philippines over and over and over that if they start the fight, Article 5 doesn't apply. But we still say that, that it applies in the case of unprovoked aggression. Uh, it hasn't deterred Beijing from operating in the gray zone. Rachel recommends that the US should support the code of conduct process. The first US statement on the, on the ASEAN process was 1995. The language has not changed in 26 years. The US continues to support the code of conduct process. But ASEAN asked the Filipinos to write the first draft of the code of conduct in 1998, and it has not made one ounce of progress in a quarter century. So there's no evidence, there's no reason to think that suddenly the code of conduct is gonna break loose and, and, and make new progress. Things like the 2018 MOU on joint exploration with uh, between China and the Philippines that Rachel cites, are already dead in the water. And Filipinos admit that they're dead in the water because China refuses to operate within the context of the Philippine EZ in those cases. It demands a degree of deference that as Rachel herself writes, is grading if not unacceptable to China's neighbors. And so for all of those things, what we basically get down to is the status quo, right? Keep doing what hasn't worked for 30 years and hopefully it breaks free because the US and China will deescalate, right? So US-China detente will somehow break loose China, Southeast Asia cooperation. One, I think that's a wildly unacceptable risk to ask Southeast Asians to take, to tell them that the US is going to unilaterally carve up a, a, a new regime with China because we really, really hope it causes Beijing to behave better than it has for a quarter century toward them. Uh, Rachel is open with the, the risk of this. She says this could result in an effectively a maritime G2 which will be wildly unacceptable and against the interests of Japan, the Philippines, and other maritime powers in Southeast Asia. But I think her subtext is, if that is true, so be it. That's unfortunate, but it's better than the alternative, which seems to be U.S.-China conflict. She also notes that this de facto recognition of China's historic rights, which is what it would be, would lead to potentially other excessive maritime claims from other powers around the world. It will be bad for the marine environment it might lead to the government of unclose. And again, that's unfortunate, but acceptable. And so I think where we really break down is I don't find either of those two things acceptable. And this really gets back to the heart of the US interests. So I think we both agree what China's interests are. When it comes to US interests, Rachel says that they are one, freedom of commercial navigation. And I would differ. I would argue that historically, the Biden US interest has been in freedom of the seas broadly. Defense of the rules, whatever they are at that moment, because a rules-based system is better than the free-for-all that would precede it. And so it's not about commercial navigation alone, or even US military navigation. It must include the rights of Southeast Asian states and Japan to exercise their own legal rights within their EZs, which would be sacrificed as part of this US China detente. The second is Rachel says, US interest is avoidance of war at any and all cost. And again, I disagree. I think historically the abiding US interest since World War II has been defense of regional stability underpinned by alliances. And a US-China detente, a maritime G2 like this, would destroy the US-Philippine alliance. Perhaps not the US-Japan alliance, but would certainly sacrifice the US-Philippine alliance and severely weaken the US-Japan alliance. And so I will wrap up there. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Greg. Really appreciate it. A systematic step-by-step -step, uh, commentary on aspects of um, of Rachel's paper. And um, I'm sorry she's not here. 
to be able to uh, reply specifically and give her views on this, <clears throat> unfortunately. Um, and I certainly won't ask Xu Shen to read Rachel's mind and respond, but I will ask uh, Xu Shen uh, if, she, if, she, if she has any comments based on the remarks made by any of the three discussants uh, before we turn this open to Q&A. And I should say to everybody, uh, if you want to ask a question, please do use the Q&A function. It's down at the bottom of the screen and says Q&A, and you have to open that up and, and write your question in there. And we already do have some, so I want to get to those uh, quickly. We have about 20 minutes left, but Xu Shen, I'll give you some time here to say something if you'd like to. Sure, thank you, Dr. Swain. Uh, and um, I think I, I uh, to a large extent, I agree with Rachel's assessment and her recommendation, but also I have similar, I share similar questions as, uh, as our panelists do uh, on some of the specifics. Uh, for example, I do share Greg's uh, concern about where and how this, this kind of US-China detente can be reached, especially when I look at, uh, when I look at Rachel's proposal of significantly redu uh, re reduce the bond ops, um, and I, I'm also reading some of the question, uh, some of the questions raised the, in the Q and A session as to whether uh, whether that that recommendation, whether uh, the recommendations that made by Rachel would, would amount to appeasement in South China Sea as to China. And my more my more specific question is how can we, even if even even if the, the Biden administration can make up some um, can make us make up uh, its mind and uh, re and significant cutback on FONOPS, how can we make it uh, to? How can we uh, make it make sure that it won't be perceived or interpreted as a sign of U.S. weakness and won't play into uh, the growing Chinese uh, Chinese perception or narratives about uh, U.S. decline power, um, and also won't be used uh, by won't be used by perhaps by China as a component of its psychological warfare to undermine um, U.S. allies and partners' confidence in, uh, in 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 America's commitment to the to 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 this region. And also, I agree. Uh, I share uh, back thoughts on uh, you know taking more into consideration about the middle and smaller power in this region. And um, I also I, I also discussed with Rachel uh, in the process in the process of her research and writing. We also talk about uh, talk over about it as to uh, the United States need to walk a fine line between not actively encouraging uh, arbitration initiated by by other claimants and not. Uh, do not present as a signal of discouraging these countries from initiating arbitration because simply the prospect of uh, other claimants initiating arbitration does represent a powerful rep uh, reputational deterrence against China, uh, which, which China does care, does care how, how its, its image will be tarnished by another arbitration, especially initiated by Vietnam, which is supposed to be its ide ideological ally. And last point uh, I would like to raise, which I also saw is a question raised in the Q&A session is about the role of domestic politics, which is le uh, which is left largely unaddressed in Rachel's report also, that also we, we discussed uh, during her writing, which I also uh, um, supported and put put my uh, my thoughts in. Because um, like uh, Professor Moshizuki has talked about uh, uh, the final Japanese disputes in East China Sea uh, uh, surrounding uh, surrounding Diaoyu Senko Islands, what, which it, it reminded me of the 2008 final Japanese agreement to conduct joint uh, development in the East China Sea, which was pushed through by leaders on both sides, but later was kind of later lacked to follow through largely due to the domestic politics played out in both countries. So how do we consider it taking into consideration like domestic politics will play out in the context, even if the, the the leaders uh, the leaders president president Biden and she can make some some uh, agreement and leverage their ca uh, their political capital to push through such kind of agreement. How would uh, the domestic populace on both sides um, respond and portray? And how the, how would this kind of portrayal will be received by the domestic uh, populace on the other side? Really matters because when one side ta start talking and uh, and um, criticizing the other side, the pop the most populace on the other side are also listening and responding by exerting pressure on their own leaders. So that's the three points I'd like to make, and I look forward to more of the uh, the Q and A session. Great, thank you very much, Shushan. Well, we we only have about fifteen minutes left, and I really do want to get to the questions. I have a lot of things that <laughs> that I could say and comment. But I, I think I will restrain myself because we do want to get to some of the questions and, and hear more from some of the, uh, from the presenters. Um, one question that appeared early on from uh, Joel Sikorsky was, is there any 
evidence that China is contemplating interfering with the commercial sea lines of communication. Short of a major power war, where cutting trade is a traditional dimension of waging war, under what circumstances would Beijing ever seek to interfere with the sea lines of communication? Would somebody like to uh, answer that? You can put up your raised hand or you can wave at me or I can call at you. Uh, Greg, you're waving. I see yeah. you. Go ahead. I'm, I'm happy to start because I think um, Rachel and I have actually had this discussion online in the past. Um, I think Beck's probably got thoughts too. So I mean, my sense is that Beijing would have no incentive to directly and purposefully interfere with commercial navigation through the existing sea lanes in the South China Sea. That said, China's claims do de facto interfere with commercial navigation. For instance, when you close the entire Paracel Islands in illegal baselines, of course, commercial traffic begins to avoid the, the Paracels. Even though those are legally still open sea lanes, no, no sane captain is going to sail through them. And presuming that Beijing also encloses much, if not all, of the Spratleys in straight baselines, as China has continuously said it will, then the Spratleys will also be closed to commercial navigation. Uh, that amounts to a, a you know, uh, changing the sea lanes, but it is still illegal interference in commercial traffic. Beck, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I do have some thoughts. Uh, I think that uh, Greg's point is well made, uh, but also that when we think about commercial traffic or uh, the sort of the economic dimensions of, of the use of the sea, that we also need to think about um, some of the activities uh, that China has been engaged in, the sort of grey zone activities in terms of um, the, the harassing of the fishing vessels via the maritime militia. And also we need to factor in uh, the harassment of the uh, oil, the, the survey vessels as being a part of commercial uh, freedom of navigation as well. Uh, that just sort of thinking about how to con conceptualise what commercial freedom of navigation is. Uh, but I do agree with Rachel's split between commercial and military freedom of navigation uh, in, a, I think it's a useful way of co conceptualising what the issues are, uh, because for Australia, for example, there's a, a, a discord a narrative that our core interests relate to trade and sea lines of communication. But of course, most of our trade going through the South China Sea is coming to or from China. Uh, and, you know, that the, the, there's, a, there's a kind of, we don't always... Uh, unpack what it is that our, our interests are, uh, but the US sort of focus has, I think, been on the military freedom of navigation, uh, which is a bit different to how Australia has been describing its core interests. Thank you, Beth. Um, another question that has come in, and uh, from Claire Lau, it's to the last speaker, so I guess that's to you, Greg. So if war is not if war is to be avoided at all costs, um, what part of this debate do you think merits armed conflict to settle, if any? I don't think any of the claims in the South China Sea merit uh, armed conflict. I think for the US, there are only two casus belli in the South China Sea, and that's an attack on a US Navy ship or an attack on a Philippine government vessel. And we've been pretty clear about that for the better part of 50 years. I mean, we've been explicit about it in public since 1998, and we've told the Filipinos about it since 1979 at least. So the question is, what kind of costs are we willing to impose that will lead to diplomatic tensions and raise the risk of conflict we don't want in order to hopefully incentivize changes in China's behavior? And there, I think there is significant work we could do on the diplomatic and economic front. For instance, I think I, I echo Xu Xian's point about the threat of future arbitrations being a valuable reputational bludgeon against Beijing. You know, great powers comply with arbitrations because it's a pain in the neck not to. And if you want to be a global leader, you've eventually got to get on board with the rules. We did it when we lost in the ICJ over, over the uh, Contra case under Reagan. The Russians did it when they were you know, just uh, sued before the PCA over the Arctic Sunrise case in 2014. With enough pressure, I think Beijing would bend its claims. Any other comments from any of the, anybody else on the panel about, about that? Um, with enough pressure, Beijing would bend its claims. Mike? Uh, 
you know, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, s simply pressure uh, will lead China to bend its claims. And, you know, when I look at the East China Sea uh, issue, uh, if unless there is some kind of uh, reciprocity uh, in terms of addressing uh, this issue, uh, the more pressure uh, that is brought to bear uh, by Japan uh, uh, with the support of the United States is basically uh, going to harden uh, the Chinese uh, position. Uh, so, yeah, certainly uh, Japan needs to be steadfast uh, about its uh, own territorial claims, uh, but just a, a policy of simple pressure uh, is not going to work. And, you know, one of the reasons why the June uh, uh, 2008 uh, joint development uh, kind of quasi agreement fell apart uh, was that. Uh, uh, the Japanese you know, really were not willing to uh, recognize that there was indeed uh, a dispute uh, about uh, uh, territory between uh, Japan and China. Uh, I can certainly understand that Japan feels that there is no territorial uh, dispute. Uh, and China doesn't on, on others. Uh, but the fact that there is this disagreement is a dispute. Uh, and I, I think one needs to start from, from that before you can move towards uh, joint uh, uh, development. Thanks, Mike. Um, well, along these sort of similar lines, there's a, a general question, very short question from William Duran, which is, well, when you consider all these factors, what, what could actually spark a hot war in the South China Sea? I mean, what are we talking about here? How, how likely is it that we could get a conflict in the South China Sea? Is this really something that we should be regarding seriously? Uh, perhaps in the same way we look at the possibility of a conflict over Taiwan? Is, I, and what we're talking here about not just a local spat between, let's say, Vietnam and Malaysia or Vietnam and China that's handled pretty, pretty quickly one way or the other, but a, a larger spat, a larger war that would draw the United States and China in. How likely, how likely really is this? Anybody want to jump at that one? Greg, I see your hand up again. Yeah, I'm willing to take all the easy ones. Um, <laughs> I, so no, I mean, look, I, I, think, I think that the South China Sea arm contingency is less likely um, and probably less worrying than cross strait contingency. And there's a reason that cross strait contingencies have become, you know, the thing occupying so much brain space around Washington. I also think that increasingly the chance of conflict in South China Sea is less likely than the chance of China just establishing a de facto Chinese lake by grace and pressure, because I think that's where we're headed already. But it's still a non-zero chance. And the way it it could start with something like uh, a ramming that causes a loss of life during the U.S. fauna, but more likely, I think, it starts with the Philippines. It starts with, uh, you know, blockade of the Sierra Madre, the old Philippine LST that's, that's ground on second time of shoal, and the Filipinos try to run the blockade, and somebody gets killed, and then the Americans get called in, and because of posturing, everybody escalates, and if we don't have the crisis management mechanisms that Rachel talks about, you know, and, and that we've never seen work in, in the case of a U.S.-China uh, case attention before, nobody answers the phone until it's too late. Uh, and then we end up in, in, in a small fight that nobody saw coming and nobody wanted. I think that's actually pretty accurate, Greg. Um, I've, I've been involved for many, many years in a project um, with the Chinese and with Americans as well on crisis behavior and crisis management. And we have at times um, simulated various crises in the Western Pacific. And one of them was indeed a maritime crisis in the, near the Spratly Islands involving the Philippines. And it did involve something along the lines of what you had just described. And it was in a context of a situation where, the, where China had much greater naval capabilities than it even has today. And that the uh, issue of loss of life and the correct handling of that loss of life, the responsibility and how it should be you know, determined, uh, what an investigation should look like, et cetera, all of these became contentious issues and ultimately really drew the United States into this situation because of the security treaty with the Philippines. And it didn't end well. Uh, it didn't end in an all-out war, 
but it did end in a very, very tense standoff. And um, it could happen, um, given the stakes that now the countries involved really have in, in so much of what goes on in the South China Sea, which I think personally is beyond what they should be. Um, I don't think it's worth the United States and China to go to war over these islands, even if you say that they have larger meaning for the UNCLOS regime, et cetera. I still don't think that they rise to that level because you're not going to get the kind of threat that I think would really threaten the, the essential vital interests of the countries involved unless it was something so egregious and so obvious um, that neither side, uh, one side couldn't reject it and couldn't deny it. But it's hard to see what that would be. In Taiwan, it's a different question. So I think it's a question of trying to manage this situation in ways that don't allow the two sides to make these sort of worst case assumptions about the motivations and the intentions of the other and about the relationship of the issue to their own credibility. And the credibility works in both directions, both for the United States and for the Chinese. And we've, I think, and by we, I mean everybody, has allowed this issue to become that kind of thing. It's becoming increasingly a measure of the strategic leverage or advantage that one nation has over the other in the aggregate in Asia, which I think is a, a very bad development, I think, and I hope there are ways in which we can reduce that kind of calculation on the part of all the different countries concerned. But that's my two cents on the issue. Um, and for, a, I'm sure, a much larger discussion. Um, some other question that was, oh, was there a, a, another hand raised? Did somebody else raise a hand? Sorry, nope, I guess not. Oh, you did, Xu Shen, is your hand up? It is. Yes, I just want to quickly add on uh, what Greg just said about external pressure. What I what I I'm thinking of uh, I I'm because I'm borrowing ideas from uh, from Alastair Ian Johnson's works about how China changes behavior into in international institutions. I think as for arbitration, yes, that exerts some pressure on China's behavior, but it more, serves more as a deterrence against you know uh, further assertive assertive behavior such as seizing extra uh, land features or conducting uh, like land reclamation activities in uh, 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 like uh, Scarborough Shoal uh, um, and other uh, land features, but not necessarily like driven for uh, driven China's behavior toward what what we would uh, what we or Rachel would uh, were here to uh, hope that drive China's behavior toward. I think uh, a, a change of a China, China's change of tactics in its behavior still need to be you know uh, like uh, be internally driven, but for external pressure, it more it serves as a more effective deterrence rather than. You know, compellence for compellence purpose. That's what I want to quickly add. Great, thank you. Just seeing here if there are any other questions that might be. Uh, um, there are some questions actually from some of the um, from some of the audience about what the United States might possibly do that could really escalate the situation in some ways. Um, there is some reference to the actions of a future president who could decide that it's in America's interest to try to close off this vital trade route um, because of some political controversy with, with China. Uh, and there's another one that has to do with questions of US calculations regarding, um, regarding the overall importance of the South China Sea to uh, US-China strategic uh, competition in other areas. I mean, how, how seriously could this get, this kind of strategic competition over the South China Sea? What would, what would drive this further in people's estimation? What would make this into a much worse situation than it is today in terms of national calculations that countries might think they're actually defending their interests, but in fact, they're making it worse? Uh, Beck, did you have your hand up? You did. Yeah, I did. Uh, if I can, uh, I, I just wanted to comment because uh, um, there was a point made earlier about domestic politics. And I think that uh, 
this comes into play here because in my view, the South China Sea has become an exemplar of China's, of, of the narratives around China's uh, position as a revisionist great power. So it's used in the, the rules-based order discourses, in the Indo-Pacific discourses, uh, to demonstrate China's ambitions, not just in the Mar not just in the South China Sea, not just in the maritime domain, but much more generally about its rule-breaking, uh, its revisionist tendencies. So I think that part of uh, the role that the South China Sea plays is with Within the domestic politics and the international politics and the way that we conceptualize China as a rising power. And that's how it contributes to um, strategic competition much more generally, I think. Okay, great point. And I think we're going to have to end it there. We've hit the eight o'clock mark. Um, so I first want to thank everybody. I should first thank the person who's not here, which is Rachel for writing the original uh, report based on her dissertation. So thank you very much to Rachel. It was very provocative and clearly had a lot of interesting uh, discussion and a lot of interesting questions from the audience. And I hope you got something out of it as well. And then I also wanna thank all of you participants for uh, responding very well, for staying within the time limits and uh, for producing a very informative uh, webinar. And we'll have more like them from the East Asia team at Quincy in the near future. So stay tuned. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye.